is clearly thinking Kate is a good egg. So let me introduce Ali. So Ali, I think this is our third webinar with you. Yeah, I, I've yeah, done so two ground works. All absolutely brilliant. And one of the reasons they're brilliant is that Ali will leave you with things to try literally the next day. If it was light enough, we could go out tonight and try it. So um, we absolutely love the way that Ali explained things. Ali will tell you a little bit more about herself, but essentially Ali is a really, really experienced coach of both and trainer of both horses and riders. And tonight she's really focusing in on one area that some of you might not realise she's incredibly experienced in as well, which is rider biomechanics. And hence we're talking about rider biomechanics and moving in harmony with your horse. Uh, she's a senior coach um, with Ride With Your Mind, um, with that system of rider biomechanics. And she has um, trained and works now alongside the founder of Ride With Your Mind, Mary Wandless, who coaches all over the world. And uh, Mary stepped in for you when we had to postpone last time, didn't she? We yeah. haven't got a freebie, which is the most amazing freebie with Mary um, last time. And you've been riding since you're 18, and there's lots. Um, there's a lot to, lot to say about you. I'll let you say a little bit more, Ali, but um, for now, welcome. A very, very warm welcome. I did mention for those of you, I'm not sure if anyone joined after I said, do please put your questions in the Q&A. And once we start sharing the slides, which Heidi, my glamorous assistant, is doing now, mm -hmm. if you ever want to make the slides a little bit smaller and see a bit more of Ali's face, if you hover your um, mouse between the slides and um, an alley, you'll see there's a little grey, a little sort of silver line and you can click and drag that across to make it bigger. Um, I think that's everything we need to cover, isn't it Heidi? Anything else you want to add? Are the slides up? Can you see them? Slides are up, all yep. good to go. Great stuff, then um, I guess we'll disappear and over to Ali. Thank you so much, Ali. Okay, hi everybody. So I think I've been introduced very well there by um, Thea. Um, so yeah, I'm a rider biomechanics coach um, and also a, a horse trainer. And the other two um, webinars I've done for you have all been on groundwork. Um, but tonight we're moving on to um, rider biomechanics. Um, so I'm a coach within the Ride With Your Mind uh, method of rider biomechanics, which really was the first rider biomechanics that kind of came out, which is about 30, 40 years ago now. Um, I do that. I'm a senior coach and I train um, other coaches all over the world now in that method. I'm also the co-founder of Dressage Training TV, um, which is an online membership site, which is full of learning materials, both for rider biomechanics and also for the groundwork system that I do. Um, and the, well, I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the very end. Um, so I think that's probably enough about me. So we'll move on now to um, the first slide, which hopefully is going to get put on for me by Heidi. And um, we're going to talk about what is rider biomechanics. So biomechanics, rider biomechanics, horse biomechanics has become a bit of a buzzword recently. And when things become a buzzword, often they don't really get understood. Um, and basically the word biomechanics means the study of how something moves. So rider biomechanics is the study of rider position um, and how a rider organizes themselves on a horse. But what's extra fascinating and extra difficult in some ways is because the rider is sitting on another moving object, a horse, this is really the study of rider biomechanics and horse biomechanics. And what's really fascinating and where I really love my work is the combination of the two. So how a rider sits on a horse influences how that horse moves. And to also quite a lot of an extent, how a horse moves influences how the rider sits. And that's often really overlooked. When you're having a riding lesson, often it's all about getting the horse to do things and not really talking about what the rider should be doing on top no more than put your, do this with your leg or do this with your hand. And we're not a disembodied arm and leg. We have, a, we have a normal body on there as well. And that's the really important part. And that's what fascinates me. That's what rider biomechanics is basically all about. So in this slide here, this is the same horse and the same person. And it's taken two years apart. In the first slide, this was the first time um, Minette, who you've seen in the groundwork as well, it's the first time Minette ever sat on a horse. 
And she sat on the horse in the way most people would sit on a chair. And this is how most people would sit on a horse. So we get on a horse for the very first time and we sit on it, one, as if it's a chair. So we put all our, most of all our weight down in our backside on the saddle. We tend to then push in our stirrups and we often then pull back with our hands. And that is to balance ourselves because as soon as we sit down on the horse, the horse starts moving and we're like, whoa, what's that? So consciously or more oftenly subconsciously, we start to balance with our feet and with our hands. And because that doesn't particularly work on a horse. And we also sit on a horse within our own natural body pattern. So some people tend to be more slumped, have bad posture, as my mother would tell me, or some people tend to be more hollow. Everybody either would favor going left or going right. And we tend to get on a horse in that way. And if you never really have any attention paid to your position, that is then your position on a horse and you're influencing the horse then. So I'm sure you can all see the difference between how Manette is sitting in slide one and in slide two, but also there's a big difference in the horse. The horse in slide one is much more hollow backed, his neck is more up um, and he's more, I'm going to say down because Manette is more down and heavy. And of course, for our first ever sit on a horse, that was great. When we then move two years on to Manette on the horse again, that's then after Manette's been given riding lessons and she's done her rider by mechanics and she's learned to sit on the horse. She looks entirely different. If you look today, you say, yes, that's a rider. If you look at the first slide, you're gonna think mm, much more novice rider. And also we now have a horse who's standing much more up and holding himself, engaging his tummy. And you could say he's more in an outline. So this is really, these two slides illustrate what rider biomechanics are and what effect it has on the horse. So if we then move on to our next slide, we're now gonna talk about what is alignment. Now, most of you will at some point in your life, especially if you learned to ride at a riding school or pony club or whatever, you were taught, taught about shoulder, hip, heel line. Um, and that's really what alignment is. And you can see from the line we've drawn here, that is your shoulder, hip, heel. Um, unfortunately, what often happens is we all know about shoulder, hip, heel. People think they're sitting in shoulder, hip, heel, but very often we're not. Because one of the big problems with how we sit on a horse is how we think we sit often isn't the reality of how we sit. And I will ask people a series of questions when I first give them their first lesson within this method. And I'll say to them, how do you think you're, you would land on the arena floor? So if we look at this correct alignment picture here of Manette, it's obvious, isn't it, that she would land, if we made Orient disappear, a la a magic, she would land on the arena floor, dead on her feet. Now, I can ask a lot of people that, and they would say they would land like that. Whereas in reality, when I then take a little photo of them to show them afterwards, they wouldn't. Because our brain tells us we're vertical, tells us we're sitting correctly when we're not. And when I change people and get them sitting correctly, and everyone watching on the outside of the arena says, gosh, that's amazing. She looks so much different, so much better. The person, the rider, is often then saying, I feel weird, I feel awful. So this is a big barrier to learning. And one of the things that a rider my biomechanics coach will do is we will actually put our hands on you and actually move you into the correct position. So we'll line you up and then we'll ask you, how does that feel then? Do you feel like you're leaning forwards? Do you feel like you're leaning backwards? And we'll do it until we get you in the correct position which is basically how Manette has changed from sitting how she was sitting to how she's sitting now. And getting yourself lined up into that position happens in one session. It's not a gradual process. We put you there. Now, occasionally we will put people there and they can't keep themselves there because they've got some issues within their body. And then they need to see a body worker um, or similar in order to be able to help them or do some exercises, some stretches and stuff to be able to get themselves in that position but generally everybody can get themselves lined up 
So what is alignment in this? This shoulder hip heel line. And what we're doing in order to get someone to be like this, you can't be pushing in the stirrups. If you push down in the stirrups, two things happen because stirrups aren't fixed. They can move backwards and forwards. When you push in the stirrup, the stirrup will move forwards. This is why people's lower leg goes forwards and gets stuck forward. So that's the first problem. So we have to learn to not push down in our stirrups. The other issue that happens when you push down in your stirrups is our muscles work in pairs. So everything, when you push down with a muscle, an opposite muscle, muscle pushes up. And we'll see a little bit later on how we talk about up riders and down riders. And so if you push down in your stirrups, you actually push your bottom up and out of the saddle. Now, human instinct is, if you're trying to balance yourself, particularly if you don't like what's happening, we all push to the ground because we all feel safest with our feet on the ground. So we have to learn on a horse to actually take the weight out of our stirrup so we just have enough weight in there to be able to hopefully keep our heel a little bit down and keep our lower leg underneath us. So we talk to, I put people's legs there and then I talk to them about things. We have a lot of images in, in the system. So I'll talk to people about maybe imagining they're holding a tennis ball behind their knee because then people start thinking about that rather than pushing down in the stirrup. Um, that works for a lot of people. Um, and then once the person, you can kind of start to get the feel of that when you're standing still. We also talk about, and this can be quite controversial, what people should be doing with their thighs. Now, if you learned to ride prior to the 70s, you will most likely have been taught to have your thighs on. You may have ridden a pony club with people putting five pound notes between your knee and the saddle. If you learned to ride after the 70s, you may well have been taught that thighs on was very, very bad indeed, and you must take your knees off. Which then got a load of people riding around looking like penguins with their legs turned out and flapping around all over the place. Because if your weight is not on your thighs, then your weight will be in your stirrup and your leg will move around. And so nowadays, people often aren't too sure what to teach at all. So they either don't teach anything. Um, or hopefully, if they're being more sort of educated, they are learning that actually you do need to have your thighs on the saddle. And you need your thighs on the saddle right from the very top, so from your groin down to your knee. And the people who say you shouldn't grip with your knees are correct. If you just squeeze with your knees, you will again pop yourself out the saddle. What you need to do is put your thigh on and against the saddle from your groin. And I'll talk about the tendons on the top inside of your groin um, as like your nicker elastic tendons, and you're trying to get those close against the horse. And you'll all know about those tendons, because if you go for a much longer ride than normal, often they hurt the next day because you've used them. Um, so it's those tendons we're trying to get against the horse, because actually the very top of the horse is generally the most narrow place. So if you get those, the tops of your thighs on, when you're experienced at that, it will often feel like your knees are off. And that's where the language problem comes. Somebody once said, you mustn't grip with your knees. You must keep your knees off. They meant you should have the tops of your thighs on. Somewhere along the line, that all got Chinese whispered out into take your knees off the saddle and turn your feet out like a penguin. And we don't see Carl Hester going around with his feet turned out. We need our feet, as you can see in the photo here, pointing forwards. With your knee pointing forward, your foot pointing forward and your thigh against the saddle. And how much you have to really think of keeping your thigh against the saddle varies on lots of things. It varies, on, it varies partly on how high tone you are as a rider. So some, most men are much higher tone than women. They tend to get on a horse and really put their thighs on. And sometimes I have to tell men to let their thighs off a bit. Some women are lower tone than others. And so if you've been used to not using your thighs, you may have to really feel like you're half killing yourself, keeping your thighs on until you get used to it. Other riders, and when you get used to it and experienced in doing this, you don't even think about having your thighs on. So you may even say the words of, well, I'm not using my thighs. They're quite relaxed. 
when really the next person is going, oh, it's half killing me to keep my thighs on. So you can start to see some of the issues that go on here with some of the language you might hear in riding arenas, which is applicable to one person and not to somebody else. So we've got Manette here with not pushing in her stirrups. She's got her thighs against the saddle. Her feet are pointing forwards. Now we're only looking at this side of Manette and we may find if we went around the other side that the other side, her leg wants to turn out more or isn't quite so organised and we have to do a bit of work on that. But we're not going to talk about that tonight. And then heading up her body, if we look at her pelvis, she has what we would call a neutral pelvis in that her um, pelvis isn't tipping backwards or forwards and her seat bones are pointing straight down. If you think, look at the little yellow line, that's her seat bones pointing down. And remember that because in a minute we're going to look at some going wrong slides and you'll be able to see the variations people do. So her seat bones are pointing straight down and her torso is, we call it like a box. So the front and the back of her torso, the back and the front, are the same kind of length. Again, we'll see on some slides in a minute how when people are hollow backed or round backed, your front and your back are not the same length. So she's in neutral spine. She's lined up, seat bones pointing down and would land on her feet. The other line that we haven't marked here, but people often talk about is there should be a straight line from your elbow, down your arm, through the reins to the horse's mouth. And here we have that. Uh, Manette's got her elbow just a tiny bit in front of her body. That varies from person to person. If you're quite short in your upper arm, then you're, you might find your elbow is slightly more forward. Um, and if you're very long, it might be dead vertical. So it doesn't matter too much. It depends a little bit. The important thing is that you do have a bend in your elbow and then you do have a straight line and that you have, and you can see here, you have what we would call a pushing hand. So I'll often stand in front of people and put my hands in front of them and get them to push against me when they're sitting on the horse. And that is the feeling of, some people talk about it like you're pushing a wheelbarrow, you're pushing the horse's head away you're not pulling back. On that very first slide we saw of Minette on her first ever lesson, she was pulling back. She didn't know she was pulling back. She was pulling back in order to try, she was going, oh, I'm not sure if I like this, trying to keep her balance. In this, she's pushing forward. And partly she can push forward with her hand because she's lined up with her shoulder hip heel line. So this is another issue. Instructors can tell you, or you can think for yourself, that you don't want to pull on the reins. If you are not lined up and in balance with the horse, you will not be able to not pull on the rein. People could tell you forever, don't pull on the rein, you will pull on the rein. In the same way as if you haven't got your thighs on, your lower legs are always going to move and you can do whatever you like to try and stop them moving. Until you learn to keep your thighs on, they will always move. So you won't hear me very often telling people to not let their legs move or not move their hands because I'll be correcting it by thighs, and by lining up your body on vertical and then like a, something magic, your lower leg and your hands are still. So it's a little bit different to what you might sometimes hear. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna move through some other slides and look at common starting points, how people would often start off on a horse. So if we can have the next slide. Okay, so this is a hollow rider and this is a hollow leaning forwards rider. Now, this actually would have been more of where Manette would go if she was going to go anywhere wrong. She's naturally quite hollow back, so she's learnt not to be. This position often you see in riders when they're worried because it goes with what we call upper chest breathing or holding your breath. It also goes with people going forwards because they're worried into a kind of more fetal position. Also, you can see that Manette's heels are really down. They are too down because she's pushing in her stirrups. Um, you can see that the horse is immediately moving because he's out of balance. She's out of balance, so he's out of balance. So he's not finding this very amusing, whereas he was very happy standing in the other position. Um, in this position, she doesn't look very happy, yeah? her body isn't happy in this position. She was actually complaining bitterly that it was making her back hurt. Um, and you often see this in riders. So, but in a nervous rider, they will often be stuck in this position. I'll also see riders sometimes in this position who then tell me that they are vertical. And I then take a video and say, look, or a photo, and then show it to them and say, you're not. And then when I get them to sit um, in correct alignment, 
they then say they feel like they're leaning backwards, they feel like they don't have legs too far back. And we have to practice that for a while for them to feel, I'm going to say, normal with the new position. If you look at Manette's pelvis, so her bum is disappearing out behind her. So her seat bones are pushing, are pointing down and back in this video. Yeah, that tends to actually block the horse. So if you were sitting on a horse there that wasn't a very forward going horse, that would be a block that wouldn't be helping you at all. It also means in this position, because you are tipped forward, you would be having to hang on the rein. Now, even though Minette's got loopy reins here, because Orin was not liking her sitting like this, sort of moving around as she threw the rein in, she's still got a backwardness to her hand. So whereas she clearly looked like she was pushing forwards before, she's now got a bit of a backward. And that's, she can't help that. It's because her body's trying to balance her because she's out of balance and her brain, her brain knows that. Okay, and also you can see that in this bottom out behind her position, she looks very light in the seat. So she's actually, by pushing down in the stirrups, she's actually pushing her bottom out of the saddle, which she's doing not because she is meaning to, is again because she's pushing down. And we often do see this in nervous riders. And because what happens is you're worried on horse, you would take this position, the horse doesn't like it very much, so maybe starts to mess around, also, you aren't balanced. Your brain is correct. You are not very balanced. And so you're not actually that safe on a horse. OK, so let's look at the next one. So this is the opposite. This is the round back and lean back rider. Now, you often see this in riders, I'm going to say, who are kind of really laid back. They may be just happy hacking. Um, they're really treating the horse like a chair yeah, and just really sitting in it. Uh, and pushing down. Um, the way Manette's kind of taking this posture, she's actually sitting really near the back of the saddle. Um, and some riders do that. Some will actually start to push really forward against the front. So everybody has a unique um, sort of way they would do each of these positions. And I kind of just let Manette choose. I just told her to be round back and lean backwards. And this is where she went. Um, again, her lower leg is actually in exactly the same position as it was when she was hollow, because she's actually pushing in the stirrups here and pushing herself back from her stirrups. So she's not as heavily down as some riders might be who were putting all their weight on their backside. Some of her weight is actually being pushed back up by the push in her stirrups. She's really leaning back. Um, we often call this um, water ski motorboat. So her seat bones are pointing down and forwards here. So when that happens, you're actually pushing all your weight and sending the horse's weight all downhill onto their forehand, onto their shoulders. Um, if, and horses have two choices here. They either bury their front feet more in the ground and go slower and slower. That would be this horse's choice. Or they become a motorboat and start going faster and faster and faster, at which point people lean back more and more and more and water ski behind them more and more and more and more. Um, and again, it doesn't matter how much you try and stop that and how obedient your horse is to the rain aid, you're never really going to fix it until we get you in alignment. Um, so we have another version of water ski motorboat in a minute. Um, you can also see she is actually pushing her hand forward, but it's very fixed in this position. So again, she's not really going to be able to move her hands and give the signals she would um, be needing to. OK, so then the next slide. OK, now this is what I often call your classic dressage riders position. This is years of shoulders back, shoulders back, sit back and heels down. Yeah. How many times have we heard that? And this is a really bad position not only for the horse, but it's a really bad position for your back. So when you're hollow like this, um, you're starting to compress your discs. You're starting to give yourself back pain. Virtually every rider who I see and presents to me in this position will in their first couple of sentences tell me they've got a lot of back pain. And the majority of them within a few lessons when I get them lined up will tell me their back pain has gone away. Because suddenly when we get them in neutral spine, they're not doing that to their back. 
Minette was complaining bitterly here that it was hurting her back and how long did she have to do this for and, and everything else. Um, so she was really illustrating as well. Her leg again is forward and her heels are round down. Her backside is still, so her seat bones is, are still pointing forward. So the same as in the other one. But somehow people often say this looks quite elegant and looks like a dressage rider. Yeah, but really the forces she's exerting on the horse are exactly the same. She's pushing this horse down and onto the forehand just when she actually wants the horse to lift up and be round if she's doing a dressage test. She's in water ski motorboat. Often when riders are hollow backed like this, and if you think back to the first one we had of the person leaning forwards and hollow, this is exactly the same as just they're leaning back and hollow. Often the person can't breathe and they can't properly because their chest is stuck up, their rib cage is stuck up. So they can't do more than upper chest breathing. Also in this position, you cannot engage your abdominal muscles. So again, another buzzword is use your core. That's really about engaging your abdominal muscles to help stabilize yourself on the horse. When you've got a very long stretched front like this, you cannot engage your abdominal muscles. So the and the only way you can keep yourself balanced on the horse here is via your reins, because if I cut the reins, you would fly backwards if you're looking at this photo, which means the rider has to balance on their reins. So it's kind of sophisticated way of doing it. Well, maybe some people, because our eyes get trained into this sometimes by via the media, we start thinking, oh, actually, this is a dressage rider, when it's not a dressage rider at all. So Orient is dropping his back here and he's hollow and his neck's come up. Now he's not looking as hollow as, and he's not as really up in his neck as some horses. This is because um, Orient is or was, he's retired now really, um, a, an advanced, he was my advanced dressage horse. So he's still very strong through his back. So when somebody goes heavy on his back, he doesn't kind of collapse in his back in the way that a, a less trained horse would do. Also, because of his breeding, he's a Lusitano, he's quite short in his back, um, which also does make them stronger. Um, but if you get a long backed, untrained horse who's very um, weak in his abdominals, this position is really going to um, start to squish their back down. And however much you want their necks to come down and them to work round, they just physically cannot do it. So this is a very dodgy position. You often see this position in a dressage test when a rider is going across the diagonal doing extended trot. And if you're on a warm blood who can do extended trot very easily, they will do a really good extended trot, only with their front legs though, not with the back legs. So at some point they'll get marked down. And when they get to the other end of the arena, because they've done it extending in a downhill way, you'll see a bit of an almighty fight going on with the rider around the corner as they're trying to get their running away motorboat back to them. So this is quite a classic position you see in the arena, in the dressage arena. Okay, we have the next slide. Now, you don't see this position that often. Um, I see, because most people who are leaning forwards tend to be doing it in a hollow way because they're a little bit nervous. Um, I see this position a little bit, I'm fairly near Newmarket and I teach quite, quite a few clients who actually do a lot of riding out of the racehorses. So they spend a lot of time a um, little bit out of, the, out of the saddle and forward. And then they come to have lessons with me on their normal horses. And they kind of think they know they shouldn't sit like they're riding out the racehorses on the heath, but they end up in this kind of position. And when I get them onto vertical and their lower leg more back underneath them, so they're lined up like our first slide, they're having a bit of a meltdown because they feel like they're leaning back on the horse's back and the lower legs miles behind. And, you know, it feels really weird to them um, until they suddenly realize their horse starts behaving like a dressage horse instead of a racehorse. Um, so I don't see this position that often, but it is one that people, that people will do. So this is someone who rounds their back naturally, but has also collapsed forwards. And again, because they, um, haven't got themselves lined up in the top part of their torso they're again not feeling that safe and so they're pushing in their stirrups so they've got the heel too far down which is then pushing their lower leg forward um, and pushing all that weight into their stirrup which is then pushing up 
and pushing their backside back out of the habit of the um, saddle. So all these riders that we've just seen, all these different positions, most of these riders would be telling me on their first lesson that they would land on their feet because that's just what their brain has started, has told them to do because they've been sitting like it for ages. And I used to have a lot of trouble convincing people, but these days arenas tend to have mirrors or I have my phone so I can video them or a helpful person on the outside of the arena will also um, realize this and take some video. And people are astonished with how they look at the beginning and how they look when I lined them up, um, as you saw in the first um, alignment. So something would be really useful for you to do is to take a bit of video of yourself when you're next on a horse or get somebody to, you only need a very short amount and then look at it and think, okay, so what sort of rider am I? Am I the hollow back lean forwards, the hollow back lean back? You might not, you might only be doing it a small amount with caricature of these today to make it obvious for you. But see if you can suss out what sort of rider you are and see what changes you can make. Um, people who are members of Dressage Training TV as part of their subscription get to send in videos, as many as they want, um, as part of their subscription to the forums, which are all marked by me. And I will tell people what to do and line them up and, and get them all organised by video, um, which is, has a, I can do this to people all over the world. It amazes me how I can do it pretty much as well as in a face to face lesson. Um, so the amazingness of modern technology. OK, so. If we then move on to our next slide, we're now going to talk about upriders and downriders. So Minette's doing a great uprider here. Minette would be naturally an uprider. So somebody who would hollow. So if you'd hollow your back, you would tend to be someone whose rib cage comes up and you would tend to hold your breath. I would say that virtually all people who are asthmatics are hollowing the back and up because it's to do with breathing patterns. Um, and if you are an asthmatic, that tends to make you get more nervous about your breathing and you become more up. Um, upriders generally are more nervous, though sometimes I see riders, um, upriders are actually riders who are trying. They're really trying hard. They really want to do it, which ends up with people holding their breath and just going, I want to do it. I want to do it. And that makes them them up. And once they start to stop trying, they stop trying and start doing um then actually that goes away so what we see here is Minette um, and there's loads of different ways you can be an uprider Minette tends to lift up from her rib cage so her rib cage comes up which takes her chest up and her shoulders up and then she's kind of up there and looks like she's holding her breath which she kind of was some people push up from their stirrups and do what we call push up and if you're sitting in a chair now watching this and you can get your feet on the floor. If you really push down with your feet onto the floor, notice how your backside comes up. And in some of you, you might find, oh, I just clenched my backside a bit. Other people will be able to really pop up, really shoot up. And um, when Mary and I do demos, and before lockdown, we did a lot of demos around the country with two, 300 people. And one of the exercises we would do with all the people sitting down in the arena, on their seating in the arena, would be getting everybody pushing to the floor, popping up, popping down. And it was fascinating seeing two or three hundred people shooting up and down. But some people would really shoot up and other people would hardly move at all. If you're really good at popping up and by pushing your feet on the floor, then you are an uprider. If you can barely do it, then you're probably a downrider. And it doesn't matter what you are. But what we want you to do is know what you are so that we can go about changing it. So I change this in people by talking to them about dropping their shoulders to their ribs, their ribs to their hips. When they sit in the good alignment, like we saw Minette doing earlier, that rider often to start with would feel slumped. Um, I don't so much now, but I did for a long time train um, a dressage rider called Sam Turner, who was, had one of the first Grand Prix dressage cobs in this country called Billy Wiz. And in her first lesson with me, she was more up and more hollow than you see in this with Minette here. When I got her lined up, she told me she felt like the most slumped garden gnome she described herself as, as she ever was. And in fact, she just looked like a lovely aligned dressage rider. So it's weird how, how it really changes how people, how people feel.
So that's an up rider. If we go to our next slide, that's a down rider. Now I had to go on and on and on at the net to get this down because she naturally doesn't go down. Now I would sit down really easily. I, I like being slumped. I have to think of being up to get lined up. But this is a person who's kind of just sort of collapsed as if they're just using the horse as a chair. They're then what we would call bum heavy. So in this version of down, Manette's actually kept her lower leg pretty much underneath her, but she's really down in the saddle, which means again, the horse will be dropping its back, bringing its neck up, or it's not doing this massively because he's very strong in his back, but there still is a difference in him. And you'll see later, we actually in a minute or two, we'll show you a video and you'll really see the difference between when a rider is up on Orient and when a rider is down on Orient. Um, so there's a down rider. Okay, if we move on to the next slide, we're now showing you, well, hopefully, <laughs> we're now showing you correct alignment in walk. Apologies, right. Let me just, <laughs> it, it, it did this before, which is what I was trying to start out. And now it let me type. Guys, I'm just going to quickly nip into the files and we'll watch the video from the file. So here it is. So sorry, there'll be a little bit of a gap when we're watching videos, but here we go. Can you do that? Okay. Yeah, we're going to watch it now. So this is Manette showing the correct alignment in walk. So you can see if Orient disappeared, she would land on her feet. She's very still. So a lot of people would say, oh, doesn't she look relaxed? Actually, this takes quite a lot of tone to sit this still. Um, so this is, again, is a bit of a problem with language that people will tell you to relax on the horse. Yes, we want you to breathe, but we need you to keep your thighs on, hold yourself still. Because riding basically is the skill or skill of sitting still on a moving object. So that's correct alignment in walk. So we're next going to the next slide, which I think is actually just a still, so we should be um, okay with that. Is it a still? We, <laughs> okay. sit, we can go away. Yes. Yeah. So this is a rider in walk doing the water ski motorboat that we looked at just now. Um, this was a rider actually in her very first lesson with me. And it's a bit mean because she doesn't sit at all like that now. Um, but this is her with her leg going forward a bit, but really leaning backwards. And you can see that her horse is really downhill and her seat bones are pointing down and forwards. So we don't know, did, was this horse before she got it already on the forehand and did she just join in? Or was she already riding like this? And so she encouraged her horse onto the forehand. We'll never know that answer, but she's the grown up. So she has to change. And I can tell you, she did change and the horse changed a lot. But this horse was really strong, dragged her around everywhere because she was water skiing behind the motorboat. And her weight is all going down, seat bones down and forwards, straight onto that horse's forehand. OK, move on to the next slide. OK. So this is now another little video. So this is going to be in a moment. Manette being hollow in walk. So she's really hollowing her back here. She's not managing to lean forwards as much as she did in the still, um, but she's doing hollow. Um, and when she's hollow like this, he kind of ignores her. Some horses would really hollow as well as often people's starting points. Um, and you can see she just looks rather up and a bit uncomfortable when she's doing this and it was really bothering her as well. So. We can move on to the next slide. Poor old Heidi. <laughs> and this slide is showing Manette starting as the up rider and finishing as the down rider. And this was really fascinating. So here she's doing her best up through her rib cage. And now she goes down. And Orient grinds to a slower and slower walk. And we'll show that again. So he comes around, it's slightly jerky, the video. He comes around here in his normal walk. The more she goes down on her bottom and bum heavy, the slower he goes, because he starts sinking into the ground. So he starts off good, holding himself, marching along, 
and then he sinks. And you can see Manette is going down on him. And, you know, when the video is not quite so jerky, this was an absolutely wonderful example of how you can influence a horse. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, Manette being more correct on Orient is good. And when she goes down, he gets too slow. Now, I've taught a lot with Orient over the years before he was kind of semi-retired. And if I got a heavy rider on him, he just wouldn't move, even though he's really highly trained. Put a lined up rider on, he'd do anything. Now, the opposite can happen. Some people get on a horse, and if that horse is already a goey horse and they are an uprider, that horse will be whizzing around all over the place. It's what people used to talk about, about having the electric bottom. It's not an electric bottom. It's how that rider is aligning themselves on the horse. So I might talk to some upriders about feeling really down in order to get themselves to neutral. And then they're going to be more in control of their horse and their horse will really change. Horses amaze me every day how they change as soon as I line up the rider. OK, so we can move on to the next slide. And the next slide is again, another client of mine who, this is a much lower tone rider, yeah? So this rider here is her first ever lesson. She's relaxed, she's going with the horse, yeah? And you can kind of see her moving from side to side. Her arms are moving, yeah? And again, the video is a little bit jerky, so we don't see it quite so well. But she really felt and told me she was moving with the horse, it was all great. But actually, She's not moving with the horse. She's just wobbling around on top of the horse. And the horse was happily wobbling around and not really doing very much with her either. And the way I would describe this is if you've ever held a toddler, if you hold a toddler who wants you to hold it, they feel easy and light. If you hold a toddler who's wriggling and trying to get away from you, they feel really heavy. And that's how a horse feels when someone is sitting on it, wiggling around. But those riders, either the, your, those riders don't realise they're moving. So this rider actually didn't re realise how much she moved in the saddle to like videoda, Or they think they should be moving with the horse. Um, and so this is, again, a huge kind of problem with um, language. Yeah, actually, the rider that's relaxed is the still rider. And a still rider takes a lot of tone. OK, go to our next slide, I think now which I believe brings us back to our first slide, or just a view of Manette in her alignment, because I think we're then on to questions for the interval. There's a, yeah, that number 15, yeah. So now we're just back to our alignment, so we can just re, get trained in with our eye again here of this is our lined up rider who would land on her feet um, on the horse after we've seen all the other things that people could also contort themselves into. Okay, so I think we're on to if anyone's got any questions before we, we move on. Absolutely, so if anyone's got any questions, please do type away um and uh, yeah ask us that's anything at all that you would like to uh, to ali i've stunned them into silence yeah no i think we have <laughs> look i well just to comment on, on my diagnosis as we've been going um i was definitely a post 70s rider who was taught to have my knees nowhere near the saddle and that meant most of my leg so yeah number one it is fascinating sometimes i teach people <laughs> and as i'm teaching them to put their thigh on they suddenly stop dead and say this is how I learned to ride in pony club. And then someone told me I couldn't ride like that anymore. And I never felt quite safe again. And it's <laughs> fascinating. They're, they're so happy they can put their legs back on again. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try it tomorrow. <laughs> um, whoa, that's, that's okay, exciting. Um, and then also, I think I'm the down rider. I Did you try the pushing down with your feet? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I'm down because I just, yeah, I think it's been slightly... Yeah, slumped or I'd call it my yeah, left. I would be naturally a down rider. Yeah, yeah. We've got um we've got a question from Liz. Uh, what is the significance of the phrase heel to hock? And what would the ride with your mind phrase be? Okay, so actually heel to hock is a ride with your mind phrase. Yeah, or it may just be that lots of people use it. So it's basically another way. We have loads and loads of different ways to explain how people should sit. And we will sometimes say to people, you've got to aim your, your heel 
towards the horse's hock to help keep that love that somebody's lower leg back yeah so i might talk to somebody about a tennis ball behind the knee or heel to hock so we have loads of different ways because the vibe with your mind ethos is that if you say something to somebody and they don't get it it is not that they are stupid and you need to shout loudly or repeat it you need to find another way to explain it and all of the imagery and stuff we use in ride with your mind has come from people saying this feels like like sam turner said i felt like a slumped garden gnome you know that's how it how people describe it yeah so heel to hock is your heel to the horse's hock for jumping when you have your lower leg forward you would aim your heel to the horse's knee because you need your lower leg forward and your foot more anchored yeah, brilliant yeah it really helps and it is the classic um helping people learn the way they learn, isn't it? The phraseology. Yeah, that and everybody's yeah. images, someone will come to me and say, you know, like riding, 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 riding with your mind coaches are really interchangeable. So I will teach somebody who's been having a lesson with another ride with your mind coach and they will say an image and I know that image or I might then learn, I'll go, what is that image? Describe it to me and then I'll use it because there's so many great images that I don't, under, I think that doesn't work for me, but I'll keep saying it because it works for that person. Yeah, yeah. everybody yeah. learns differently. And that's our job, not our job to keep shouting at people as if they're stupid, which is the old way of doing it. I think there was another question I saw come up from yeah. Kate, was there? Heidi, do you want to ask it? Oh, I can carry on. You, if you carry on, I'm just putting yeah, yeah, sure. number order on the next video. So it's... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry. Um, so yeah, Carol said, what angle would you consider correct for your size? 45 degrees to the ground. And that was so Mary Wanless, who started this method, um, one of the she's a physicist by nature, which is how this method came about, because she was really put off by she is a BHSI, um, but she kept saying that all the words that she was being told to say just didn't work. She kept seeing the top riders all seem to be lined up the same way lower down the ranks people were just doing what they wanted and there was no really coherent instruction so she went and studied quite a few of our top dressage riders and one of the things she came up with was they all had their thighs at 45 degrees to the ground um and so yeah so that's a flat work 45 yeah. degrees yeah yeah it's about that isn't it yeah yeah if, the, if, if you are a higher level rider so if you're very strong very high toned and you know sort of the top level dressage rider you may have them slightly more vertical and if i'm starting someone off and they're a little bit more novicey and maybe a bit lower tone i might make them just slightly more horizontal but we're aiming for 45 degrees in everybody and that's the angle that gets you to land on your feet on the floor and i guess if you're looking third side down uh, your thighs on the horse that depends on the shape of the horse I guess of it does it but yeah no, yeah a little slightly, bit they slightly turned in I guess aren't, aren't they as yeah sometimes I'll, I'll often talk to people about this you know the feet pointing forwards thing if you think as if you if you if anyone skis think of snow plow yeah because uh, yeah. naturally people would tend to turn their feet out on the horse yeah at least one but at least one of each of our legs would like to do that if you think as if you're pushing your heels the outside of your heels out against the resistance so you feel like you're snow plowing that actually keeps push your inner thigh on which is what we want from the top and keeps your feet pointing forwards yeah. and i'll actually put my fist against the outside of people's heels to get them to push out against to feel a resistance we do a lot of resistances to help people work out how much tone they need to be able to hold their bodies in that position yeah, it very much reminds me, how do you not go to the same Pilates instructor? It very much reminds me of what um, Beth, our instructor, is a rider as well. Yeah. So she's, yeah. yeah, there's quite, there's a lot of Pilates comes in to, to riding. We have several Ride with Your Mind coaches who are Pilates coaches as well, so they're very imagery, very the same. Yeah. And um, you know, keep asking questions, guys, if there's anything that would help, would help you with your horses. <coughs> I think, oh, we've got one on, yeah, we've got one on the chat here. So Kate said, do you think riding without stirrups puts you in a better position? Oh, say no, please, Ali. I hate riding without stirrups. Well, yeah, <laughs> we tend, uh, I tend, and actually ride with mine, I think tends, to not do it that much to start with. The reason is that it's much harder to do sitting trot with stirrups than without stirrups. Yeah. And the reason is, what I was explaining earlier about we like to push for the ground. So as soon as you go to do sitting trot with stirrups and you bump, you push for the ground. 
yeah? And so you're pushing your stirrups, which pushes you up and makes you bump around loads more, yeah? If you take your stirrups away, you can't do that, which is great, isn't it? But the moment you take your stirrups back again, you're pushing them again because they're there. You know, our brain isn't stupid, is it? Yeah? So that's one of the issues. So we would tend to do sitting trot with stirrups first. So the person has to learn from the word go, you know, notice how you're pushing in your stirrup, don't push, yeah? Can you keep the ball behind your knee? That kind of stuff. Um, the other thing about riding without stirrups is it's really good to do if and as long as you ride with your legs in the correct position. Mm -hmm. So it very much used to be taught, and I still do see it taught now sometimes, about really stretching your legs down when you're doing sitting trot. So you end up with um, vertical legs, completely straight legs. All that does is tip you forwards onto your fork, onto your pubic bone, and it doesn't help you at all. So um, it, what you want to do if you're riding without stirrups, you need to be able to hold your leg in the correct 45 degrees lower leg underneath your position. And then there is some use to it. Yeah. But we would always start you off with stirrups first doing sitting drop because you need to learn about not pushing in them. If we take them away, you won't push anyway. Yeah. And so, so would you gradually lengthen the stirrups perhaps so that you're sort of taking your leg longer and longer? And, and... Until they, well, because they would be yeah. at the correct, the 45 degrees anyway. Yeah. 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 True. So, yeah. No. Brilliant. And um, I noticed, uh, I can't remember the name of the rider that you said she felt like the horse was, was going really forward and she was too, but she was bob bobbling around a little bit too. Yeah, much. the lady on the colour, yeah. Yeah. Now, on the one hand, I guess you want to move with the horse, don't you? But you want to do it in a manner where you're controlled. So, so moving with the horse, yeah. if you watch, so think of some of our top riders, they look really still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's moving is if you think of your seat bones as if they're going into two little holes in the saddle. Yeah, we talk, we call it plugging in. So like a plug going into a socket. Yeah, you're, when you're moving with the horse, your seat bones are moving a tiny bit in those plug holes. That's as much as the movement is. That's as much as Carl Hester or Charlotte de Ardan is moving. Yeah, when as a, as a general rider, we think of moving the horse, we start shoving with our hips and going all over the place. Yeah. And all we're doing is wriggling around and actually unbalancing the horse. So most riders have to think about holding themselves still in order to be moving with the horse the correct amount. It's far less than you think it is. Right. OK. That's yeah. Good. And it all depends on the rider. Some riders just don't really move. Yeah. So like Manette, right from the word go, she's quite high toned and she wouldn't wouldn't move. Yeah. So some riders can not be in the right position, but hardly move. And other riders can be kind of in the right position, but wiggling around all over the place, front, back, side, side. You know, because they either think they should or they're just a bit hypermobile, maybe, or lower tone or whatever. And they have to learn to be still mm -hmm. and I often divide riders up into ones I think should go and do yoga and ones I think should be off doing Pilates. <laughs> yeah. And I can guarantee you the riders that are wriggling around all over the place will then tell me that yoga is their favorite activity and they do it really well and go to advanced yoga. Yeah. And I'll be like, no, no, no. You need to head off and do some Pilates. Yeah. <laughs> and then some riders who are much stiffer would actually you know, do well to go and do some yoga. Yeah. So we tend to be either people who need to do yoga or people who need to do Pilates. But we always choose the thing we're better at, don't we? Yeah, very true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So really, we need to be able to move and be still. And as a, as people, we tend to be good at one or the other. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> shall, shall we continue with the, the next video? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Right, I've, I've got the videos in order, so we won't go back to the slides. We'll just watch these videos. <laughs> Okay, so what we're moving on to now, oh, wrong, wrong one, that's the end. Yeah, we're going to be doing in a moment rising trot. And we're showing you rising trot mechanism stationary. Now, rising trot, there are hundreds of different ways you can do rising trot on a horse. And only one way is correct. And it's really hard to do this stationary. Um, and what we're looking for is that the person's lower leg stays still. And the next pretty much is now there's just a tiny little wiggle every now and again. But what in order for your lower leg to stay still when you rise, you need to rise with your knee as the fixed point. So in rising trot, you would think probably more grip with your knees. A lot of people have to feel more knee on. And so you're rising with your knee on as the fixed point. Your thigh is a lever and it levers your pelvis 
up through a quarter arc of a circle. And at the top of the rise, you should be pretty much vertical. Yeah, the net's got a very slight lean forward here. It'd be better if she was absolutely vertical. When you come down from the rise, you are in motion slightly lent forward. And that is correct because the horse is moving along. If you felt you were going to be vertical when you landed, you get left behind. So at the top of the rise, you should be vertical. And as you land, you should be slightly forward. And you're trying to do this without hollowing your back. And you can see Manette here has a very slight hollow. And you're trying to do it without a massive push in your stirrups, um, which you see Manette has a tiny bit of, but it's pretty good. And what you want to try this on your horse tomorrow, standing still. Um, and you're trying to do it and you want to stop at the top. So if you can't stop at the top, like Manette keeps demonstrating here, you're not in balance. And if your lower leg goes forwards, because you're not keeping your knee on, you will wobble backwards. Or you will save yourself from wobbling backwards by pulling on the rein. And as you can see here, Manette is able to keep her hands pushed forward as she rises and sits. So she's not interfering with the horse at all. So this is the correct way. So let's move on to the next slide. And we're going to show you the not correct way, one of the not correct ways with a couple of non correct ways, I think. Okay. Okay. So that is the rider that is doing a huge push in the stirrup. Her leg goes forward, and as she sits, it goes back. You can also see she lands heavy. Because Manette's pushing in the stirrups, as her leg shoots forward, she overbalances and falls backwards. She can't help herself. And you can see Orion go, whoa, losing his balance. And that's an established horse. Yeah. And this is how you see a lot of riders doing it because no one's quite, well, they haven't worked out. You've got to rise from your knee. And instinctively as a person, when someone tells you to go up and down, you would go push down to stand up and sit down. Whereas rising trot is really a forward and back movement. Because you can also see here that Manette is doing a massive great rise. And that's because she's standing up and then falling down, standing up and then falling down. Yeah. And she can, whenever she pushes in the strip and her leg shoots forwards, she has to, to some extent, pull on the rein. Now she's negating this because she's let her reins go long and opened her fingers. Because when we tried to do it without that, he just stepped backwards every time because he's being obedient to the rein signal. So that's a wrong way of doing it. But if you don't know that you should have your thighs on when you rise and you and rise from the knee, that is how you end up doing it. And if you work out that you shouldn't bang in the saddle, you will tend to then start doing tiny little rises. And that doesn't work either because you're then not keeping up with the horse. OK, I think we might have another. Have we got another version of this or is this the only no, version? No, that's the only version. That's the only version we've got. Okay, we're on to the classroom one now, are we? Yes. We okay, are. yeah. So we have some now some ways of getting you to be able to do this at home. So you can have a go at this at home tomorrow. Um, if you've got bad knees, you want to put some cushions under your knees. So this is Manette doing rising trot off the horse. So as you can see. Because her knee's on the floor, she's able to lever herself with her thighs. At the top, she's dead vertical. and She's not hollow at all. Her hands keep pushed forwards. She's not hollow backed. She's not round backed. She's just doing a super job of rising. If you do this, either do it in front of a mirror or set up your video so you, for the side so you can see yourself and just notice what you would tend to do. Because whatever you would tend to do is what you would do on a horse. And the things to notice are that you can keep pushing forward with your hand and that as you rise, you don't hollow. You're vertical at the top. And as you land, you should be just a tiny bit forward. And as you go up again, and you should be able to control the up and the down. So you can see here, the net's really nicely in charge of the up and the down. And if I'd said to her, pause halfway, would have killed her thighs but she could have done it. So this is, this is the way I'll generally teach people when they're first doing it for the first time, particularly if they're on a clinic with me, though I have been known to get people off horses and demo and get them to do this on the floor of the arena. Um, 
this is the way to really feel it in your body without if you try and do this in movement without knowing what you should do because your horse is moving and slowing down and speeding up and maybe doing whatever whatever else you just can't get the focus on your body okay if we go to the next one we've then got a couple of ways that i commonly see it um, not happening correctly so that if you see yourself doing this you can work it out so we're going to have i think first the forwards this is the hollow back person this is the person who's rising from their chest so they're pulling themselves up from their shoulder which means they lean forward and then they land forward as well and you can see in the saddle Minette wouldn't have brought herself all the way back so in the saddle the person would stop here and rise again so they end up getting more and more forward and hollow backed this again goes often with the more nervous rider um, again, they're rising with their seat bones pointing backwards the whole time. They often don't land quite in the saddle. If you do this on a goey horse, what tends to happen is that the horse gets in charge of the speed because you're not doing, you can see Manette's doing, not able to do a smooth up and down, which means she can't control the rhythm of the rise and sit. This means that the horse can get in charge of the rhythm, which either means they don't want to go, they tend to not go, or they start whizzing off and the person can't quite stay um, correctly in sync with them. Um, and this also is very bad for your back. It really hollows your back. Um, that was complaining a lot while doing this. So and you can see also her hands tend to be pulling back as she's doing this because, because she's not able to rise from her pelvis and her abdominal muscles, she's going to be using the reins to an extent as well. OK, so if we then look at the next one, this is another way that you could rise up and down incorrectly and again which way you choose is a bit down to your body pattern this is the person who would tend to do it leaning backwards so it might be the slumped person or it might be the hollow lean back person the dressage rider now if you are leaning back at the top of the rise you're going to go bang yeah and Manette would go and you saw Manette doing that on the horse when she went bang and Orient really hated it she can't control it she cut you if you're leaning back at the top of the rise you cannot control the coming down. So you either crash down and pull on the rein, or if you become more sophisticated, you learn to not rise very high. This means you never get to the balance point, and it means you can't influence your horse, which is as bad, I would say, than the get to the top and crash back down version. And you can see as well when Minette's doing this, she can't keep her hands out in front of her because she has to kind of almost pull back with her hands to try and balance herself as she comes back. So that's another way of doing it, which is incorrect. So have a go at that at home and see if you can, one, see what you would naturally do and then see if you can correct it and then take it onto your horse and see how that feels, how that feels different on your horse. OK, so if we go on to the next slide or the next video, rather. Um, we've then got a couple of videos of people sort of starting doing their rising trot. So this was a rider, we've seen her before. This is her first lesson with me. And she doesn't really know yet about rising from the knee. So she would tend to be the lean back at the top of the rise rider, crash back down into the saddle. Horse is going on with his back down and head very up. Um, this horse also kept wanting to stop because he was like, well, every time she banged down, he would lose his balance and, and walk. He was a fairly untrained horse at the time. Um, he's not like that now. And her lower leg would go forwards and backwards. And you can see that in the video as she's rising, her leg is moving forwards and backwards as she rises. Um, then if we move on to the next video, this is a, a client who's been doing it a little bit longer than me. Um, and she's riding a cob of mine who would naturally be very slow. And if you line yourself up and can do and hold your body weight and do correct rising trot, this horse reaches in the rain and off she goes. And if you get on and you're a bit bum heavy and your legs a bit forward and you're a bit shoving your weight around, she just stands still and won't move. Um, so she's a she's a really great teacher. And this is a little bit jerky, but you can pretty much see this rider's leg is still. They're rising, they're sitting, they're in control. Their hands are still. The horse is staying reached in the rain. It's always a bit of an issue because our videos never play that smoothly. But you can see that she's much more in balance and still than the, the previous rider. OK, so I think that's all the slides now, isn't it?
So we're now on to, if, you, if you're really interested in this and you want to do more of this, then you've got a few options. You can join Dress Life Training TV, which I haven't actually written on here. Um, and if you do fancy joining Dress Life Training TV and you get a lot of videos, hours of video of myself teaching a lot and Mary Wanless, you also get to be able to put a lot of videos into the forums, so that which I personally comment on. The whole groundwork system is also on there. And if you sign up with a code I'll give you, um, then you're gonna get 10% off your first sign up. Um, and it's a monthly subscription. So the code is in capital letters, Ali, so A-L-I, and then it's underscore, and then capital again, offer, O-F-F-E-R, and an underscore 23. So if you put that in, you'll get 10% off your membership of Wrestle Training TV. You also have, um, you can find me on my website. You can just Google Ali Wakelin. I have a website and a Facebook page. I run, I do lessons. I teach quite a few places around the country. I run camps from my base near Ipswich in Suffolk. Um, and there are also other rivalry online coaches around the country. Um, and you can either find them by going on the Ride With Your Mind um, website, or if you contact me, I can always tell you who is who is near you. Okay, so I think we're for questions, I think now. We are indeed. We Thank are. You. Thank you very much. That was fabulous and fascinating. Um, so <laughs> well done for the videos. <laughs> well, it, it, it ended up quite smooth in the end, didn't it? Yes. So it, wasn't, it wasn't too much of a disaster. Yeah, yeah. What's going on there, but yeah, tech always comes to haunt us. So, folks, type away with your your questions, your Q and A, um, whilst we um, will continue to to chat to Ali. Explored them, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm thinking about my trot diagnosis, and I think it's harder to 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 um to come up with that. Yeah, it is. It's hard because things think, happen yeah. so fast. Yeah, you need to sort of analyze yourself on video, and we're so lucky yeah. these days because we have pivots and and you know and and people on the side of the arena just will video a bit of you. I mean, one of the things on my camps is that everyone's lessons, some of bits of their lesson every morning are videoed. Mm -hmm. And then in the after everyone's ridden in the morning, we do a video feedback session where we all look at bits of video of each other, of everybody. And um, it's fascinating because people will see the change in the lesson. And also you get to see other people and you learn so much by watching the six people in every clinic, watching each other, because everyone does something that someone else does. Or yeah. you see somebody doing something you used to do. And you're like, I don't do that anymore. But it's a really supportive and great learning thing. Video is such a powerful way to learn. Yeah. Um, and once you learn to, to see what you need to watch on a video to analyse it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's brilliant. And yeah, and I guess having video lessons is another fabulous opportunity that we can do these days as well. It's it just... is. Yeah. Either kind of live ones or what I do a lot on the forums. We have people from all over the world on Wrestle Training TV. And some people have made massive progress by just sending in videos yeah. yeah and then i will analyze their video write down what they need to do they practice come and come back again and it's yeah. it amazes me how much people can absolutely improve on a, by a video link yeah absolutely and sometimes it's better than a live zoom because they can take it and read it and play it again and just keep looking at it yeah yeah absolutely um yeah. can i come up with a question where can we find out about your camps and um, if you just go on Ali Wakelin, so it's www.aliwakelin.co.uk, um, there are details of my camps. All the dates are on the website. They are all full, but I do get spaces on a waiting list. Um, and also I do, you can come outside of camp times and do your own mini camp. Either just you on your own or you and a friend or you and a couple of friends come for a, a day, two days, three days, as long as you like and you can make it as intense as you like or bring your partner and we're in a really touristy area um so some people bring husbands and in the afternoon they go off sightseeing or they just come with the husbands and go off cycling in the afternoon or walking the dogs or whatever they want to do so contact me and i can give you some info on that that's awesome yeah and if um, we were chatting before you've got a hook up on the yard so if you go back down in your lorry you can hook up and yeah we have stables and hookups and grazing <laughs> and a lovely lecture room and showers and central heating and kitchen and yeah we're, so we're, we're pretty no, well equipped watch that we're gonna move in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you. i know i just realized i think i'm moving in ali <laughs> i know that's great uh, well, I don't think we've got any more questions because I think you've nailed it again. And have I nailed everybody? Yeah, we had more questions than normal this time. 
normally oh. everyone so just before we, we leave just a couple of things that are, well, a few things that are coming up in the next few weeks to the end of april so um we've got steph croxford um speaking to us uh on the 11th of april so steph's a grand prix dressage rider her most famous horse is mr president um and she's also got a, a couple of other um, horses working at Grand Prix level so top tips from a very down-to-earth pro um, from Steph. Um, we've then got uh, Lucy Grieve who's an equine vet talking about uh, weight issues so to generally too chubby um, but I guess also the other end of the scale too um, and then we've got uh, Leslie on the 25th of April from Balance International talking about a holistic um, approach to functional saddle fitting for horses so uh, yeah very different and very interesting things coming up. We're looking forward to that. Um, but all it remains to say is a massive almighty thank you to, to you, Ali. It's been brilliant as always. Um, it's been good folks, folks, when you leave, um, there is a little quick questionnaire that comes up um, just to give us some feedback uh, and also to let us know things you'd like to know about in the future. So if you can answer that, that'd be amazing. Thank you very much. Oh, Julia says, thanks for a fantastic webinar. Yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it. Oh. Loads to work on this weekend. <laughs> Excellent. Absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah, thank you very much, Ali. We'll hope to see you again very soon. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.